Uh, yes, uh, I'm Kent Miller. Um, I uh, manage a portfolio called Remote Sensing and Imaging Physics, but as uh, Dr. Carrick said, its uh, main thrust is uh, understanding the physics that enables space situational awareness. Now, space situational awareness is a lot bigger field than imaging, and we'll talk about some of that as, a, as it goes on, but the main thrust of the portfolio is imaging and, and uh, electromagnetic propagation. It's understanding the propagation of electromagnetic radiation in uh, how it relates to the formation of images and the transmission of, of information. My uh, portfolio is divided into, in general into these two main areas. This is sort of the core of the, of the portfolio, the observing and identifying of space objects. Um, and uh, the talk will be organized in this, mainly in this way. The uh, beginning uh, part of it talking about the improving of imaging of, of the space objects, and this is mainly tied to the, uh, to the uh, Maui Space Surveillance Site and people that work with uh, the telescopes there on how to improve the uh, imaging of satellites. But uh, the uh, future, I think, and, we'll, and again, I'll talk about it more as I get into it, of space situational awareness. It's not the big, big telescopes. Uh, they're expensive. There are two of them. Uh, they're not going to build any more Starfire optical ranges, I don't think, in the near future. And so, and so the future, in the future, we've got to understand how are we going to get information about these satellites without imaging the satellites. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. It's a difficult area to come up with new 6-1 ideas, and so we have uh, areas that will, I hope, feed into this area. And then uh, this last area, predicting the location of space objects, is uh, related to space situational awareness more than to imaging, um, but it's an important part of it. You can't do, for example, you can't observe the satellites if you don't know where they are, and, and it becomes a big part of the the mission of Space Command and how we relate to them to, to work with the uh, prediction of space objects. Well, as I got into this subject several years ago, I, I became interested in <coughs> the question of, of uh, why you can't do adaptive optics anytime, anywhere. Uh, the adaptive optics, we all see the adaptive optics results in the, in the ast astronomy. You see these big telescopes and you get this, the uh, deep space images that are as good as a Hubble taste space telescope. Well, they're, they're looking straight up at night. <laughs> yeah, better. And they're, but they're looking straight up at night when the atmosphere is quiet. And uh, as the Air Force, we don't have that luxury. We have to look low on the horizon. You have to look in the daytime times when, when, uh, when adaptive optics cannot uh, clean up the image. And so started looking at, at way at uh, what I at that time called extreme adaptive optics, but what has now become propagation through deep optical turbulence, and it also relates to uh, propagation, horizontal propagation of high energy lasers. And it'll talk about that and, and the beam control that, that relates to that. So to uh, set the stage, this is a slide I showed last, um, last year. Uh, simulation of the Hubble Space Telescope as you would see it using the AOS telescope in Maui. Um, big telescope, 3.6 meters, built to observe and image satellites. The Hubble orbits at a, an altitude of about 700 kilometers. And so this, this uh, pristine Im image is what it looks like. And here in the corner you see a, a, a D over R naught. D is the diameter of the telescope. R naught is the uh, can be thought of as the correlation length of the atmosphere of the turbulence in the atmosphere, and so at the terminator, good scene conditions, D over R naught is about five, and that, this starts. This looks a lot like a lot of the best typical case uh, images that are published by uh, the people at Amos. Uh, normally at night, the uh, D over R naught is closer than 20. And so you get images like that. And so you need a lot of post-processing in order to turn this into something that you can recognize as a satellite and, and, and what's on the satellite. 
Well, in any other battle space, situational awareness would not be good enough if, if the only time you could observe the, the adversary was a couple of hours around sunrise and sunset, and he knew that. This is what the same image would look like in the daytime, and it's not, it's not sky background. The problem is it's turbulence. And uh, so the problem becomes how do, you, how do you see satellites whenever you want to see them and not just during good terminator conditions. And uh, these, these first few um, slides I'll show are from a, a project that we call Protea. And uh, um, I... Uh, well, anyway, it's a group that, that is dedicated to improving the, the imaging of space objects, mainly through, through uh, information theory and, and uh, information science, but uh, um, they, they're concentrating mainly on, on the uh, images, the, the, the imaging capability of the AMOS telescope. This is work by Stuart Jeffries at the University of Hawaii. Um, the, uh, Data on the left are ab actual observations of CSAT. This is the Hubble Space Telescope in simulation. This, for example, here, D over, D over R naught of 27, that after, after uh, the image is taken and, and then uh, you've done the post processing you can do on it, this is about what you get of an image of the Hubble Space Telescope with this uh, D over R naught. Well, um, by using Fourier techniques, what they call uh, spectral ratios they, uh, and understanding where in the, in the spatial um, spectrum there is information and where it's noise. You, by cleaning up the image that way, by using what they call uh, resolution diversity, they're able to now uh, improve the current capability where if you uh, image the, uh, the CSAT, you can see their artifacts here. and uh, you can't really tell what they are, by using this, this compressed multi-frame deconvolution that, that they call it. Um, they're not only able to, to uh, uh, perform the, the operation much faster than before, but they, they're starting to draw out these, these uh, features. So you can actually tell if you're at NASIC looking at this satellite, you'd see, well, yeah, this is a solar panel. This is an antenna doing uh, SAR imagery. Um, so, so we're working to develop uh, better and faster ways to do the imaging. Uh, this is work by uh, Peter Cra uh, Crabtree at RV <coughs> using uh, intensity interferometry. Now intensity interferometry is interesting because you can get much higher uh, resolution than with amplitude interferometry, but it's noisier. Yeah, this, is, this is similar to uh, quantum op optics techniques, but it's a, it's a technique that it's not new. It was uh, developed in the 50s by, uh, uh, who was it, Hanbury Twist and Brown that, that uh, measured the, the diameter of the, of the star Cirrus using intensity interferometry. The, the thing is that by doing techniques similar to in this former slide where they, they, uh, they not only uh, do the uh, the normal um, uh, intensity interferometry that, that would give you a higher resolution imaging image through turbulence, but you, you can involve that with an observation at low resolution that uh, at uh, longer wavelengths. So you don't have the problem of turbulence that you do with the, wave, the optical wavelengths. And by convolving the two, you actually get a better image. And so th this, this technique works not just in intensity interferometry, but, but as I showed in the last slide in, in, uh, in um, the observations at uh, optical wavelengths, you get more different kind of information by looking at longer wavelengths than you do at the higher wavelengths. And, and the, the name of the game is to add information. A few years ago, Chuck Madsen went through an exercise uh, looking at uh, kramer rao lower bounds and showed that the PSID algorithm that, that is used now at Maui was really giving as good of images as they could with the information they had. And so the, the exercise now has become 
how do we get more information? Where, where are different uh, ways, to, how are different ways to, to generate different information with the same telescopes? Um, last year I showed uh, um, a slide from uh, Chuck Madsen and uh, Brandock Calif where they were taking the uh, aperture of the telescope and dividing it down into smaller regions in order, in order to clean up this, uh, make this D over R naught number smaller, and then combining the, uh, the images from the different regions of the telescope and cleaning up the, engine that, in, in, the image that way. Well, this has evolved into an exercise. It's really just getting started now, but to realize that, that you get speckles on the, uh, on the image plane that translate to uh, speckled regions in the, in the uh, pupil of the telescope that do the same thing. And so they're looking at, at trying to understand this speckled pattern on, on the telescope and see if they can, they can, by understanding which speckles to use and where, which regions of the telescope not to use or the pupil not to use, how to clean up the image in a, a telescope. They're seeing, um, well, these plots at the bottom relate to um, the, the distance between local maxima becomes an optimization problem, and those of you that were here the last couple of days and, and listened to uh, Fariba, Faru, and Don Hearn, uh, it's that kind of a problem. How do you get around all of the local maxima in, in trying to um, develop the image um, when you don't know where the global maximum is? And as it turns out, as the uh, uh, turbulence increases, that if you can tell which of these speckles be are still um, above the noise floor, I guess you might say, which ones you can actually use, it, be it uh, becomes an exercise in, in uh, well, you reduce the, the area that, that you're using on the, on, the tele on the telescope to only the region that will uh, give you the best image, and so this D over R naught number actually is, be, is reduced this way. Um, okay, and then this is again work by uh, Stuart Jeffries, but also uh, teamed with uh, Jim Nagy at Emory University, who's uh, a, a more of a pure mathematician. Um, by uh, defining constraints, in the, uh, the functions that, in the, that they use to, divide, to define the point spread function in the images. And uh, preconditioning the, se the second derivative, they're able to now take an, the uh, standard uh, image of, of this satellite. This is what, you, what we would get now using the, uh, the PSID code that's used in Maui. And uh, preconditioning the, the, uh, the image not only be able to clean the image, but this, uh, this plot here is uh, the number of iterations versus the uh, point spread function uh, error. And you see convergence here uh, it, with their new preconditioned code related to what's being done now, this, this uh, code that's being used now. And so it not only gets you better, a sharper image, but you, you do it faster. You can, uh, you, you can, uh, form these images really in real time now or before it's taken enough computer time that you haven't been able to do that. So these are, um, <coughs> these are uh, projects, like I said, mainly aimed at uh, increasing the, the resolution of, of images, of the information that you get from images from, the, uh, from these large telescopes. Well, uh, like I said, we're not going to build any more of the big telescopes. And uh, how the question becomes how you get the same information from the, from the satellites that you would get if you could see an image of the satellite. Geosynchronous is becoming more and more important uh, to the DOD. And uh, at geosynchronous altitudes, you can't form an image. The, the physics won't let you, with the size of telescopes that we have, it won't let you form an image at geosynchronous altitudes. It's really too far away for most radars, and so you can't even get the radar uh, informa information, the, the inverse SAR information that you can on the lower altitude satellites. And so it's a big problem how to get information from satellites at geosynchronous altitude. 
at even at low Earth orbit, the satellites are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, CubeSats are becoming more and more, uh, um, well, as, as, as the electronics is becoming more and more miniaturized, they, they're finding they can do things with CubeSats that they couldn't, where before they were mainly university projects, now they're becoming real projects. The, the National Reconnaissance Office has a big CubeSat program. Now, for example, that they're working with universities on. CubeSats are 10 centimeter cube. That's really the limit of, of what they can see now with the, with the radars that are tracking satellites. And so, so how do you, so the challenge is, how do you get this information on each object when they're, when they're either too far away or too small? You don't have very many sens sensors. The big telescopes are expensive. Uh, often you don't know who put the satellite there, what, what it does. And uh, you, they're getting to be a lot, of, a lot of things in space. And so you have these massive data sets, and, and you need to be able to deal with them. So the question becomes, how do you extract the information from an unresolved object? There have been a lot of people that have done uh, projects trying to un, uh, deconvolve spectra from satellites that hasn't been very successful. Uh, and so uh, I think the direction that this part of the portfolio is going, and I don't really have a lot in it right now, but I think the way it needs to go is, is into information. What information is needed? What's not needed? Are there untapped sources of information? And by information, I don't necessarily mean imaging. Imaging may just be a red herring. It may not be something you want to do. And so the path forward is to, is to use smaller, cheaper, more diverse sensors, um, fuse the sensors and the information, and it all comes down to information theory. And I think in the, uh, the uh, reorganization that they're, they're contemplating here at AFOSR, the space situational awareness portfolio will be, will be uh, in the department with the information people and not with the physics people. And, uh, and I think that's where it should be. Um, I have a few projects that, that are related to this area. This is uh, Sudhagar Prasad at the University of New Mexico. He's looking at machine vision um, techniques. There, there are a lot of areas in, phys in physics and, and in, in, uh, in engineering topics that, that are actually mature fields but are not, have not been tapped into uh, by people doing space surveillance, and this is one of them. Um, He's using uh, what they call superquadrics. These are uh, like, uh, you see, it looks like the hyperbolic equation here, except instead of uh, integer exponents, they're, uh, or, or instead of this being a squared, you know, it, it, it can take on uh, other numbers besides and integers. Use the oh, sorry. <laughs> I started looking over there, and then, then OK. Anyway. So you get the dif different shapes depending on the exponents. And so this is a, one of the ways that the machine vision people define shapes and, and uh, have their, their um, and be able to recognize shapes within uh, the machine vision context. And so he's, um, he's, he's developing this in terms of, uh, of, uh, of identifying satellites. If, you, if all you have from a satellite is one pixel, you can tell by, by the change in the, in, the, in the radiometry, for example, in the spectra of that pixel, a little bit about the shape. And so you can uh, estimate the rotation, translational motion, uh, for example, and, and then by using techniques that they, uh, the, these machine vision techniques, he's developing ways to recognize the rudimentary shapes of, of satellites. Um, and, um, and this is work done uh, also in the, in the lab. Paul Curvin at, uh, at Maui is the lead in this lab task. But he's looking at what information, what is the minimum set of information you actually need to understand what a satellite looks like. What is, and he's found that by, if he has a, a wireframe model, if he knows Canada, uh, has a library of, of of uh, materials, BRDFs for material. And uh, then he looks at these uh, 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 radiometry measurements of satellites. He can, he can tell, and, and he probably can't see this past the front row, it's hard to see it here, but 
these are candidate materials. And um, by uh, going through his analysis, he can say things like, well, the bus is covered by this, by, mainly by mylar, and the, and the, and the uh, uh, solar cells are silicon-based solar cells, something like that, based on all that. Well, the question is, do you really need all this information? He's found that uh, by recasting his uh, approach, um, he's able, if you don't know the, uh, if you don't have a materials library, for example, you can do much of the same, the same analysis and uh, be able to tell the main composition or the main, the main uh, surface of the satellite without, without this library. And so he's starting to, one by one, eliminate the, uh, the um, sources of information to see just exactly what is, it, what, what is the minimum set of information that you need in order to identify a satellite. And, uh, and this is, <coughs> this is a, a, an interesting area that uh, kind of uh, combines two areas that I'm not really into a lot in my portfolio, but are interesting to me, and one is active imaging. All of what we've talked about before has been as related to passive imaging, but this is active imaging. If, you're if you have a laser to illuminate your source, um, how do you identify the, ta the, the target? What if you've got a, a, a turbulent or obscuring source in front of you around the target that's also reflecting the, the, the laser radiation? And uh, anyway, it's, it's combined with polarimetry. And I funded several polarimetry projects over the years. Uh, polarimetry is something that everyone th seems to think should be able to give us more information in identifying satellites, but it hasn't ever, in my opinion at least, lived up to its potential. It seems like it's a hard measurement to make. Um, it's a hard measurement to interpret. But uh, this is Aristide Degario at the University of Central Florida. He, he, uh, he is developing a technique to, to be able to see a target through obscurance uh, by uh, extracting the state of polarization by mixing the, the field with an uncorrelated reference having the same frequency but a known pol polarization. And so um, as a result you get a, a determination of the spatial distribution of the polarization states and from that you can pick the, uh, the target out of, out of, the, out of the, uh, the background or the, or the obscuring screen in front of it. Um, interesting thing about that is, is you can do the math, it, it's a, a, a completely analogous to do the math in, in, a, in, in a time uh, varying, you know, this, this is a spatial representation of it, you can do a time, time representation of it and, and do the same thing in time if you have, if in uh, your signal. So this is interesting to be able to be able to pick targets out of out of, out of uh, obscurance or also out of noise in a, in a uh, uh, time uh, varying fashion. Now let's see. Okay. Um, now the location of space objects is an important parameter in, in all of this equation. Now this is a plot that I think a couple other people have shown. It shows the, the year, this is year in this way. And this is the number of objects in space. And it starts in 1950, I think, when the only orbiting object is, was the moon. So there was one. Uh, the, the, the good old days. <coughs> the, the uh, OK, the spacecraft, this blue line, I don't know if you can, you can see, pick it out here, but the blue line here is, is actually the, the number of live spacecraft. Okay, so there are about 3,000 of them right now. Um, this jagged line here is space debris. You see it increasing over the years. You see a decrease here during a solar maximum when the atmosphere expands and, and the low satellites are all, all uh, re-enter. See a big jump right here and another big jump right here. Well, the first, the first big jump is the, uh, was the uh, Chinese ASAT test when they shot down, <laughs> you don't shoot down a satellite, and they found that out. You, you, you hit a satellite and it just spreads debris all over the, the space. 
And then this here, this jump here was a collision between an iridium satellite and, and a dead Russian satellite, which again increased the amount of debris. So now there's, they estimate, well they track, I think this is right, there are about 20,000 objects that are tracked. This means they're 10 centimeters or bigger. Well, um, I, I wouldn't want to be hit in space by something that was just smaller than 10 centimeter either. You know, the, 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 um, they're actually developing, a, putting an, a new space fence, developing a new space fence that is supposed to see down to about one centimeter. And the estimate is that there are about another order of magnitude more particles between centimeter, 10 centimeters and one, one centimeter. So now where they've had, they have to keep track of about 20,000 objects, after this comes online, you've got 200,000 objects. And how do you do it? Uh, huge number of objects, not very many observations. They'll, they'll be able to see it from a few places in the world. Um, we don't understand how to propagate uncertainty. Um, and the biggest problem in tracking satellites turns out to be space weather and Cassandra mentioned it in her talk, how uh, neutral density turns out to be the biggest error in the tracking of low, altitude, low, or low Earth orbit satellites. Um, and so it's a problem of conjunction analysis is, is a real problem in, in a situation like this. When are you, do you have to worry about satellites colliding? I've, I've heard, and I, I don't know, this is just a, uh, anecdotal, I'm not sure that, that it's uh, that's really true, but I've been told that, that the people that do these things went back to this iridium Russian collision and said, now, should we have been able to predict that? And, and even tracking those two satellites, they couldn't predict the, that collision. Now, I, I don't know if that's right, Doug, you might know better than I do, but, but it's a real problem. And how, how, do you, how do you know if two satellites are going to collide? You can say, well, okay, there's a probability. There's an error region that you don't want to be in. And so if you're in the uh, space station and, and uh, it looks like there's something going to come within that region, then you have to expend all that fuel, move the space station, it's been done several times, to get out of the way of something that, that may or may not have been close enough to collide. Um, anyway, uh, other things here, Clo closely spaced objects, if, if two objects, especially at geosynchronous, are, are close in space and we should be having to worry about one, one of them. We can't, uh, can't tell, take, tell them apart. Um, anyway, so, so these are the challenges in, in, uh, in this uh, big problem of space objects and space debris. Um, it's an area that, there's, that I've had a little bit of a hard time finding uh, good 6-1 projects in. Um, the, a lot of the research was done, done uh, 20 years ago to define or astrodynamics. Astrodynamicists will probably uh, not agree with me on this, but, I, but the, the one area that, uh, that I have uh, identified that seems to be a, a real need in this area is how do you propagate error? How do you know a day from now, two days from now, three days from now, where your satellite, not just where your satellite's going to be, but with that, to what precision? And uh, the air doesn't, doesn't propagate as a Gaussian. You know, most of, the, most of the air analysis that you do propagates Gaussian errors. And you see here, this is uh, uh, position in, in uh, Cartesian coordinates, but you see the error early by doing a Monte Carlo uh, calculation of where the satellite is going. You see the error is not... Uh, um, Gaussian at all. It has this funny shape to it. And so how do you deal with that? And so, uh, oops, wrong way. I have three uh, projects that are, that are looking at different ways to propagate this error to try to understand how you know how, where a satellite will be and how well you know that. The top one is, is Murray Baja. He's at uh, RV in Albuquerque. <coughs> doing what he calls adaptive en entropy Gaussian information synthesis, Aegis, it's called. But it's a, it's a sum of Gaussians that he, um, he propagates and um, by uh, uh, using um, 
information theory to understand his ambigu ambiguity, he either increases or decreases different, different small Gaussians then gives and makes a sum out of these Gaussians to try and understand this error. Uh, this is a young investigator project at the University of Buffalo, Dr. Singla, that is doing something similar by doing a Gaussian mixture model, but he's also uh, using chaos theory uh, as a, um, together with this Gaussian mixture model to, uh, to predict the, the, uh, the shape. And this, for example, this is uh, the dots are a Monte Carlo simulation of, of a satellite, uh, of, of the satellite position. And the, uh, the uh, lines are his prediction of, of where that satellite should be. So it's actually working pretty well. The uh, third is, is at Numerica Corporation, Dr. Ar Aubrey Poor, who's one of the world's experts in, in this area. We've developed a nonlinear filter that uh, combines the, the complexity of the Kalman filter with the performance of a Gaussian, Gaussian sum filter and is also showing good results of uh, propagating this error. Um, well, this is fine unless your satellite is doing its own moving. Uh, what if a satellite is thrusting? And how do you predict where it wants to go? If, if I, if, uh, and um, I think it was General Kaler at Space Command has fam famously said, if a satellite, if I see a, a satellite starts to, starting to maneuver, I want to know where it's going, when it'll be there. I don't want to have to wait a day to find out. And so this is, this is work at the University of Colorado, Dan Sherris, working with uh, Terry Alfriend at uh, Texas A&M, that are looking at uh, ways to, to predict based on, uh, on uh, cost functions that, that include the fuel costs and capability of a satellite, a rigorous and hypothesis-free approach to characterizing the actions of a thrusting satellite. So in a nutshell, he says, okay, given the um, mass of the satellite, the amount of fuel that you estimate that's on board, uh, after this maneuver, this is the, the volume that that satellite can be in. Um, so anyway, try, trying to understand again, propagate these error volumes so that you understand not just where it will be, but how well you know that. Well, okay, and, and the last one in this area, this is a project at, uh, in Japan at um, the Dr. K uh, Kitazawa at IHI Corporation, but he also is working with the Dr. Hinata at Kyushu University, which is <coughs> important because it's really a, a a breakthrough into the Japanese, uh, um, the Japanese space community, which has been hard to hard to make a, uh, inroads into. But anyway, they they use uh, they they combine the predictions of satellite motions. If you have a group of satellites together, how do you? Um, it's hard to pick out a dim satellite and a group of bright satellites, and so by combining orbital predictions of the satellites that are there and uh, um, reducing it by by doing that you're he's able to pick out a dim satellite in the presence of a bright satellite you see this field here is is all affected by the brightness of the other satellites by predicting the motion of the first satellites and one of the things that's kind of neat about this project is he's working with the, the uh, Taiwanese uh, National Central University people that we also work with to uh, get the data for this, uh, for this uh, study. Um, okay, well I'm running out of time. Uh, so in the other area in my portfolio, this of uh, propagation uh, through deep turbulence, Like I said, it started out as a as curiosity about how far we could push adaptive optics. But it seems to have culminated this year into what I hope is a perfect storm that will make, make some progress here. We have a MURI that, that is in the review process now. It hasn't been announced yet. But in addition to the MURI, these are the projects that are all coming together this year, and I'm hoping to be able to get them all to work together in, the, in, in, in uh, advancing this area. 
the, the JTO, the Joint Technology Office in Albuquerque, has a, an MRI topic almost identical to the MURI topic that's also in the review process right now. I have a, an STTR to develop a, a, a test bed in, in propagation through turbulence. The Young Investigator grant, uh, four con gra conventional grants, two lab tasks, two tasks at AFIT, an international research grant at the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft in Germany, and also a NATO study that uh, is very closely related to this. So lots of things happening in this area all at once. And it's an area that uh, has been interesting but not solved for a long time. In fact, it was, a, it was a challenge that was given by the SAB to RD several years ago to solve this specific problem. Um, I'll just hurry through this. This is from uh, the combat uh, experiment. I talked about it last year that actually showed by propagating for between the Big Island and, and Maui that the Kamalgarov theory just doesn't work over long distances and especially through uh, deep turbulent. It's uh, uh, several thing. Uh, it's not isotropic. It, it's not uh, different frequencies. There are different things happen, and these are things that are not supposed to happen in Kamalgarov theory. Um, and so there's, this is our. This is my lab task. One of my lab tasks at. Uh, Kirtland, it's uh, the assault lab. Uh, Daryl Sanchez is the director of it. They're looking at one of the one of the uh, features of deep turbulence is that uh, there are points when the amplitude goes to zero in, in the wave, and when that happens, your phase is un, undefined. And how the uh, question is how to uh, how to mitigate that with adaptive optics? Well, you can't do that because the phase is undefined. Adaptive optic optics just uh, manipulates the phase, but they've realized that at this point, uh, a branch point they're called, where the, that forms, um, it also shows the presence of, of angular momentum, an angular momentum photon, and by realizing that, they're able to, using a MEMS me mirror, compensate for that so they can, they can correct for these branch points, which is a real breakthrough in this. And uh, this is another, and I'll just kind of hurry through this, it's a, another high risk um, experiment that's actually going on right now at White Sands. Uh, R.J. Nachman, a couple of talks from now, will talk about, probably talk about short pulse propagation, short laser pulse propagation, and how a short pulse, an extremely short pulse, can propagate through, through the atmosphere unattenuated. Well, this is, um, Terence Barrett is, is doing a similar thing with polarization. Turns out molecules in the atmosphere are, are uh, they're tensors, they're, they're actually dipolar, but they, their absorption depends on the, the polarization of the, of the wave. And so he's pulsing the polarization like RJ would pulse the uh, intensity and uh, seeing if, if, the, if a continuous wave can also propagate through the atmosphere in the same manner. Well, okay, uh, that's kind of a quick way through it. I'm out of time, I was gonna talk about these transitions. STTRs are great. You'd be able to take research that you've done and, and, uh, and put some money on it to transition it into the, into, uh, the real world. These are some examples of, of uh, STTR transitions. JTO Muries are, um, I've had a JTO Muri in aero optics that is also transitioning into the 6-2 world where they're actually flying two airplanes and, be, and at a speed that they can see supersonic flow over the turrets and look at the uh, aero optics um, and, and study ways to mitigate the aero optics. And they are there and you can look at that later. Um, and so I'll just put on my summary and uh, take questions. We have enough time for a quick question or two. Hi, Kent. In your um, low luminosity object uh, project, what was the differential between the high and the low uh, uh, visual magnitude? Between the bright and the, the very dim objects? Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to go back and look at that uh, to be sure. I, I think I've got it in my notes, but I don't know it. I'll talk to you later about it. 
Um, I had a quick question about the polarization yeah. uh, through propagation through turbulence slide that you had up. So would that be something that would be incident on an object and then reflected and you try to get yeah. information? Well, what happens when the, polariz when, when the polarized uh, beam is uh, incident on the object and then returns? I mean, the polarization is going to be affected, isn't it? Well, yeah, I, I think the idea is that the polarization of, from the object doesn't change, and the polarization from the... Well, I mean, couldn't you, I mean, if you're incident on an object, I mean, isn't that, couldn't that somehow affect the polarization of the beam, or is that, how is that going to be maintained? Well, yeah, the, <coughs> it will. It'll affect the polarization of, you mean, uh, the, uh, I'll say, for example, if you've got well, a... We, we can take it Yeah, offline. we can take it yeah. offline, but yeah. but, yeah, it affects the polarization of the beam. But it affects it in a different way than than a, than a random medium that you're trying to see through. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm just having trouble getting my head around yeah. that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I think that's the difference because it'll affect it in a different way, and so by by looking at the difference between the way the object affects the uh, the the beam and the, this uh, random medium in front of it affects it, then you can pick the object out of the out of the uh, okay. clutter. Great, thanks.